Welcome to Exhibition. And hello, Suzanne Archer. Oh, hi, Richard. Good to see you. Very good to see you again as well. Um, and your exhibition is We Are the Stars at Nicholas Thompson Gallery in Melbourne. Um, and, and does this exhibition have, um, well, what you might describe as a unifying theme or a, or a common focus or, or are the works very much independent of each other? No, actually, in this case, Richard, the, um, the works really are independent, pretty much one another. You might find two or three that relate, but generally um, they stand alone and they've been selected as work um, for their, the quality of the work and the, the size of the work and all those things that one has to consider. They're wonderfully rich works, both in, in the process and, and in the, the surface of the works and, and the colour and form and, and composition. Uh, but do you regard them as having subject matter or, or are they essentially a, a, a kind of a process-driven, more abstract work? Well, I guess underlying my work, there's, there is the abstraction, but also, as, I, as you know, I live out in the bushland area of Wedderburn and the bush has seeped into my imagery over many years and it has become a bit of a focus over the last few years but they often have things that are um, objects maybe from around my studio that I place in the work to disrupt what we uh, naturally recognize as being landscape to try and give the painting some other kind of form and interest area. And when you say disrupt, can you give us an example of, of what you're trying to achieve with that? Are you, are you trying to create surprise or is it essentially a compositional device? It works as both, but it's mainly to have the, well, for myself, it makes it more exciting um, to work on that painting because I put something in there that I then have to work with. And often it is something that's very unrelated to the work. So I then have to find a way to have some, make some sense of it being there. But the sense is usually that it's just arrived in the work. And so for the viewer, they might look at it and go, what does she mean by that? What's that about? And it will, it will actually involve them in the work much more than them just walking up to it and going, oh, it's a landscape, it's a still life or something like that. So perhaps can you talk us through uh, now one or two works in particular? Um, and let's begin with the work Glyph. Uh, and, uh, and first of all, why the title and what does that refer to in the work? Well, I guess it comes from um, hieroglyphics, um, the idea of having writing. Um, I'm absolutely in love with writing and words, uh, the look of them. And I have many di um, things like dictionaries and um, I, get, I go through dictionaries and thesaurus to get titles for my work. But in this case, glyphs relates to the scribbly gum with all what looks like lettering all over the gum tree spark. And um, if you are looking at this work on the right hand side, you will see what looks like some writing. And that is a direct response to walking in the Wedderburn landscape and seeing these particular gum trees and this amazing patterning on them that looks so much like writing. In Splendour, which you also um, have an image of, I've actually written, you'll see that the word Splendour is written in there. And that's happened a few times in my work. The work Splendour is the one I'd like to go to next. Uh, and uh, can you give us some more sense of that work? Because uh, in, its, in its palette, uh, in its apparent approach to paint in some ways, it seems quite different, for example, to uh, Glyph, which we've just talked about. It is. It's a much lighter handling of paint in it. And my, my plan was in the heat of summer was to try and paint something that reflected that hot sun, um, the reflection reflected light. And it, you're absolutely right, it's very unusual for me to work with such a light pal palette. But this painting is, um, it's really about the landscape in summer. And if you look very carefully, you'll see there's a, a large bird form from a, um, a, a skeleton of a bird that I have hanging in my studio. Uh, from, uh, from the sun, to the stars, and let's now look at the, the work, uh, which is also the title work of the exhibition, um, We Are the Stars. 
I really love to surprise myself when I'm working. I have no idea what the work is going to look like at the end. So I just start painting and I'll put in, I'll look around the studio, that's been my recent habit, and see what things I can interject into it. Now, We Are The Stars has that upside down head on the right hand side. And um, that is actually just on the wall. It's, um, it's an, I think I cut it out of an older painting and it just is pinned up on the wall with a lot of other objects. I, I have a lot of reference to my work on the wall. And um, so I just put that head in there. And then later I had to sort of think, well, okay, where do I go from here? So my process is to work against whatever I put down, I will then work against it. And when I get to the point where I'm no longer working against it or I can't find a reason to continue, that is when I, I think, well, I've completed the work. But this is really, would originally have started as a landscape again, although the color changed. And um, I have to laugh on Instagram because people comment about, because I put my work up in stages and they often will comment, oh, I love the color. And I think, aha, uh -huh, tomorrow <laughs> it will be different because my works take quite a long time. They can take up to 24 plus days to actually happen. That doesn't mean I'm painting all day for 24 days, but it means it's each time I approach the painting to work on it again. And so with this work, it may have started out with a completely different color bias, but it's ended up with unusually this bright blue, which I do love. And um, then these strange objects, and it's not, it's strangely balanced because the head is very close to the center of, although slightly up, I think. Um, and that seems um, like it's a little bit uncomfortable in its composition, and I like that too. Um, I'm, I just like, again, that word disruption um, comes up again in the description for me. You mentioned earlier the, uh, the importance of the landscape around you and your observation of and involvement with it. Um, the next work I'd like, to, like us to have a look at is uh, Land Script. Um, and I, I wondered whether the title and, and the nature of it refers essentially to your observation of, of geological and, and maybe biological processes. I think um, my paintings come from very much from within. I'm not actually a plein air painter, but when I'm just going um, and walking through the landscape, I think I just, in, you know, I just inhale the landscape for want of a better word. And it's all there within me. And I'm surrounded by it every time I go out my studio or outside the house. And I think um, I have a natural inclination that when I start a painting or work on a painting, it refers often to things from the landscape. So landscape for me would be uh, started out probably with reference to uh, interlocking branches and the kind of um, forms that come up in the landscape. And then again, it, it also reminded me again a bit about the writing, the rhythm of writing, particularly ac um, across a couple of the forms that go across the painting, seeing this sort of um, slightly um, staccato sort of marks that they're making and they seem to me to describe perhaps the the branches or the um, intertwining of the landscape forms. Let's have a look at a, a final specific work, Fledge. Uh, this is a, a large work but there also do seem to be some skeletal remains in there. There is. It's Fledge from Fledgling, and it is a little sad little Fledgling that I have in one of my cabinets of curiosities in the studio. I have several cabinets that are full of skeletons and bones and all matter of things. Um, once I started collecting and I tell students, um, then they would say, oh, I came into, when I was coming into college today, I found this parrot in the gutter. Do you want this parrot? And so people were bringing all kinds of things. People have given me um, their, their old uh, skeleton collections. Um, yeah, so I've been very fortunate in that way, but that's where Fledge came. It's this little tiny bird that's completely dehydrated. Yeah, so that's, that's the main um, focal point. Um, and it might, as with a lot of those works where I have put objects in more recently, they might not be um, overtly jumping out at you when you first look at it, but you gradually see these things arrive again. The landscape being 
the, the main um, environment in the painting. You mentioned a while ago about the, the process of making the works and how they can take many, many days and go through a considerable number of, of iterations. Uh, but, but can you give us more of an insight into what, what that process involves for you as you're making so many changes? What are you, what are you responding to and what are you looking for? Well, when I put a, a lovely clean canvas up on the wall all ready to go, I have to um, mess it up before I start. So I usually get some acrylic paint and I just start making marks and I'm not worrying about what I'm making. I just get all the marks going and I get the surface of the painting covered. That's, um, they can be many colors, but I actually get it covered. And once I've got this covered, I've got something to actually work with. So I'll start in acrylic and that might go on for, generally I'd say it goes on for two or three days where I work in acrylic. And having decided roughly that it's relating to landscape or it's relating to water or something like that, I'll map that out generally across the surface. Then when I feel that I, I have a, a bit of an, a, a direction, after about three days I move into the oil paint and I use medium number one and I will start to work the surface and it's very I work very instinctively I don't um, have a you know as I say a, a preconception about where it's going to go I just respond and once I put down something then I'll respond to that and so over the next few days I'll continue to work with medium one, number one and something will start to emerge from from the painting which will push me in a certain direction and then I will eventually start to recognize something in it that I can actually really build on and this will go on with medium number one maybe for four or five days and then eventually I'll go probably into medium number two it, it does move around a bit but gen this is generally what I do mm -hmm. so I move into number two which um, is a more fatty medium and it doesn't dry so quickly and I will go with that for a few days and then um, gradually as we get through, um, probably <laughs> much closer towards the end of the painting, I may just use some straight oil paint. But as I say, sometimes it can happen quite quickly. The subject can become very apparent to me quite quickly. And then I am able to you know, uh, complete the painting a lot quicker. You are a past winner of the Dobell Drawing Prize and, uh, and you're a finalist in this 2021 Dobell Drawing Prize. How important is drawing in your practice and indeed in the, the painted works uh, that you produce? Um, drawing has uh, been there from the very beginning. I've always loved drawing. And I have discovered that I love drawing with multimedia. So I will draw with my, my ink and my charcoal and my colored pastels and mix them together as well as doing um, rough drawings in, a ske in my sketchbook for ideas that I might um, you know, use in paintings. I also love to set up still lives. Um, years ago, I set up still lives that went from the floor to the ceiling of my studio of all bits and branches and all kinds of matter from the bush and put in bird feathers and everything amongst it and created huge drawings. Um, but um, now I tend to set up a specific thing. Um, in the Dobell, I actually used that same bird that we were talking about in um, Splendour. I used that same, I think it was probably a seagull, and I hung it up outside in the area where I draw. And I just started with that image and then continued. Um, and I just love mixing all those drawing medias together. And, and we're talking about large drawings in that instance. But I also do small small drawings, but it's yeah, it's really fundamental to the practice of gathering gathering um, uh, images of things that I'm interested in, but also discovering new marks, different patterns, different threads that can be taken across into the painting as well. So they go backwards and forwards. What what appears in drawings or in my sculptural pieces will often appear in the paintings and back the other way. Your practice does. Uh, include many ceramics and, and other sculptural elements of various sorts. What are the, are the challenges and benefits of, of working in so many different forms and so many different ways? 
what I love about the, the other media is while the paintings are very wet, I will often have several paintings up on the wall at any one time to allow me to move between them so that they are at different stages. But if I've got one very large work, then I sometimes have to leave it to let it dry a little before I can progress. And having another medium that I can turn to, like ceramic um, or cloth or paper, um, I will happily move across to that. Um, I, just, I just love the fact that I can go 3D and I can actually hold the thing in my hand and move it around and get a different point of view from that. Whereas when you're doing a 2D thing, that is the view you get. Last year, there was a, a major publication of your uh, works, Song of the Cicada. How important is uh, a publication like that to an artist? And, and, and how challenging was it to pull all that together? It was a huge, huge, huge effort. Um, it was also very stressful. <laughs> and... Um, it involved a huge amount of time on the computer, sending requests out to galleries that actually had my work in their collection. And then Sue Garside, who actually wrote the, the um, essay for the book, she and I went through a lot of the work and she helped me not only select that, but she also helped me manage the project, which thank goodness, because it was just so huge. You have to have about two years to get something like this together. That's how long it took me, but it was, it was, when it was done, it was thrilling to actually hold the um, book in my hands. And Alison Bell, who was the actual um, designer, I give her every credit. It was fantastic. Let's, uh, let's finish with a, a little bit of day-to-day um, -day pragmatism. Um, you and your partner, artist David Fairbairn, uh, have uh, a separate but adjoining studios. And you're, you're both highly disciplined artists. Um, and practitioners, but what is your daily, your daily approach to the making of art? Can I just qualify? Our studios aren't adjoining the actual separate buildings. They were adjoining when we first came down here because we were in one large studio, but no, this is, um, these are quite separate buildings. Um, now, our, um, we get up in the morning and we will have breakfast together and we will discuss what, you know, just general, what we're gonna do with the day. And then around, I'd say probably these days, it's more like 10 o'clock, we head off to the studios. We have fallen into this pattern where our working day is, um, it synchronizes. And um, as you say, we are very committed um, artists. We spend as much time as, as we possibly can in the studio these days. For a long time, I taught, well, and as did David, we both taught um, at the National Art School um, as sessional teachers. And so that, that sort of broke up the week. Well, now since um, retirement, <laughs> we're able to just work um, in our studios um, full time. Well, that discipline and commitment that you describe uh, has produced an extraordinary exhibition. So, Suzanne Archer, thank you very much for sharing your exhibition with us. Thank you very much, Richard. Good to see you.